All right, welcome everyone to Virtual Global Spine. Thanks for joining us today. People are all still coming in from the waiting room. I'm Wendy Gibbs and I am joined by co-host Jonathan Rizzoli and we've got Michael Galgano, we've got Mike Selby, our great panelists. And I'm really pleased that we have Dr. Alexander Mamagani from Switzerland, another one of our new fantastic panelists who's gonna be doing our presentation today on complications in spine surgery. Can't wait to see these cases. So maybe, why don't we go ahead and get started? We have a good number of people here. I'm gonna turn it over to you, Alex. Yeah, thank you. Hello from Switzerland, Alexander Mamegani. I'm an orthopedic spine surgeon uh, near Zurich in Baden, Switzerland. And I um, <clears throat> love to show you some cases from complications. Um, oh. Not all are my complications, but the most severe are my complications. And we all love to show the good cases and uh, tell you uh, what we can do. Um, and today I show you just cases where you say, oh no, uh, this shouldn't happen, or oh, this is hard. And I just start <laughs> with my disclosures. Um, it's not related in any way. Uh, it's the opposite, I guess. Uh, I'm, perhaps I'm not invited any longer. Um, and my first complication, the first case I want to show you is not a surgical one, but it is maybe it is surgical. It's conservative treatment and failure. Uh, something went really bad. And maybe if there are interventional radiologists or neuro reds like Wendy listening, um, please have a seat, sit down. It's not easy. <clears throat> so this patient um, was um, in pain. He had a herniated disc, C6-7, and it was uh, very clear for him that um, he doesn't want any surgery. So conservative treatment, but it was not good. Physiotherapy and painkillers did not work. And so um, he asked for um, another solution. And um, now we can do injections. And may I ask Wendy from the beginning, what kind of direction do you prefer? Do you go um, translaminal epidural from the back or do you go transforaminal when you are asked to do some steroid injections? Yeah, so I before my current practice, I actually never did any cervical injections. Most people don't do them because they're perceived to be more dangerous. But now in my practice, I do do foraminal injections. Um, just the way our practice is set up, we have uh, pain management, which is anesthesia, who does procedures under fluoroscopy. And if it goes to them, they would do an intralaminar, but only at 7-1 or 6-7. So this case might go to them if you want an intralaminar. I do the foraminal at all levels. So that's a long answer to your question. And uh, no, this is the perfect answer because if you listen to this conference quite often and if you are really a frequent um, a participant on this conference, you will notice that no matter where you are, uh, the treatment options are getting more and more similar. It's exactly the same here in Switzerland. So this patient uh, went to um, a pain specialist and anesthetist and under fluoroscopic um, control uh, injection was performed. But um, during the injection, um, he felt a sudden electric shock running through his body, and then complete tetraparesis was onset. So it was a disaster. And uh, from the um, hospital outside to our um, university center, it took two hours, and then later he was in the MRI, and we found these images. And um, so for a spine surgeon, especially an auto guy like me, it's very <laughs> necessary to, to have a neuro rat telling you what we see. Uh, Wendy, can you help me again? Can you tell me what you find in the myelin? What is this dark dot what we, that we can find here? Well, Edema you know, is easy for me. Edema is easy for you. Anytime we have a T2-weighted image and we see something black, that's blood. Um, or, I mean, I guess it could be air, but I've never actually seen air in that location. So I would say anytime I see something black, I would worry about some kind of blood product. We will but listen to you later. We will listen to you later. <laughs> and so this is T1, it's black as well. And uh, here you find his steer. 
and it's always the same uh, changes in tramedullary you don't want to have. And this is the actual view and the patient recovered a bit, but it took a very long time and he didn't recover fully. Um, there was a severe hemiparesis, severe brown cicar syndrome uh, left. Um, so the patient um, was not fine. And later, two months later, we have seen him again. And this is two months later, the defect, the persisting defect. So the black thing has vanished. The black thing is not there present any longer. Is this, is this gliosis? Is this, is this CSF? What can we see here in intermedullary? Can you help us again, Wendy? Alex, did, so you said periridicular. Is that the same as foraminal? That, I'm just yes. wondering the, the yes. root of the infection. Yes. Transforaminal, transforaminal, okay. yes. So because what I was thinking is there's no way they could have hit the cord with their needle. That's impossible no. from that approach, I would think. So the only other thing would be they injected something either into the nerve root sheath, which is unlikely, or into a vessel. And that's the only way I could see having a cord issue like this. But it seemed like your immediate images already had like a syrinx in it. Or was that not, it was it just edema at the beginning? And now it's a right. little syrinx. I think it was edema and this is two months later. I am not so very good in and these um, special sequences. It's not my, my business as an orthopedic spine surgeon. Um, but I can tell you the pain was still there and the herniated disc was still there and it's wasn't getting worse and the pain and the patient they are really unlucky uh, and the the physician doing the injection is the most unluckiest so this patient had a radicular pain went into injection therapy and turned out with the tetra and uh, with the brown cigar so this is really a bad case and so what uh, what did i learn from this case uh, I stopped um, cervical injections on my own. So until this, it was 2011, I did them uh, under fluoroscopy as, uh, on my own. I was trained so, and I stopped with this and I sent them all to a CT guided neuro rat or interventional radiologist or our guys from anesthesia. And they are really good in it. And as Wendy said, they do it not above C6. It's always C7, TH1 or they do it like this. And um, 10 years ago, I stopped with this. And I, I'm very happy that I stopped with this. Um, I, can, I can sleep a little bit better now. I do crazy dangerous stuff in the OR. Um, I don't do these anymore. So the same like in the US, like in your institution. So the next case. Uh, Alex, this mind if I interrupt you for one second? I just yeah. had one quick question. Um, if you were, I, I'm just curious, I guess maybe we can just ask opens up to the audience and our, our panel. If you were to operate, let's say, assuming this patient wanted surgery uh, on that uh, on that disc, soft disc herniation, what, what would you offer that patient out of curiosity? So for me, this is uh, um, an ACDF uh, candidate for ACDF. Uh, I think for posterior, it's a little bit too much in the middle. It's too medial. But I guess if you are doing a lot of fricom, a lot of posterior for you know, facetotectomies, you can do it from the posterior as well. I think, as always, mm -hmm. many options. Um, but I'm an ACDF guy here. Yeah. So I was thinking, so ACDF, arthroplasty, or you do like a posterior phenomenotomy and try to take the disc out. Uh, so the, the arthroplasty right? TDR um, um, discussion is uh, quite in the young patients, I do um, TDR as well. Uh, if there's no presence of neck pain, this patient was not a candidate for me. Um, he was too much neck pain and a little too complicated after this complication. So it's um, for me, it would be ACDF. But he refused and um, we, we all agreed not to do any um, oh. more dangerous stuff. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I, I meant uh, even before the injection. Just, just yeah. if I got walked in with a radiculopathy, um, yeah. with that soft disc herniation, what would be your your gut uh, surgery? Just <clears throat> so in this in this case, that. it would be ACDF for me. Him, it would be just simply ACDF. Uh, I would not do it TDR in this uh, situation. Um, maybe it takes too much time um, for for me uh, to um, to show you the reasons why. 
um, but um, uh, the, um, the neck pain, the presence of neck pain he had, not only radical pain, says for me, TDR is not a good option. So I'm just a hurry a little bit <laughs> because I've got seven cases. And um, <clears throat> the next one is a, a more impressive one. This was my patient. He was a healthy guy um, and he had um, pain and um, he had a Rottweiler and he couldn't walk with his Rottweiler with his dog. I don't know whether you know how a Rottweiler looks like, uh, a little bit scary. And um, because conservative treatment was not successful, uh, he asked us and um, the findings, the MRI, this was the one I shown on Twitter today. Uh, very easy. It is a herniated disc. It went up uh, till uh, the pedicle. Um, and it was clear uh, we can help this patient. Um, and he was scheduled at the first position on the day. And we did microdiscectomy. So me, I did microdiscectomy at 4.5. Everything was fine. It was less than one hour. And he was in the recovery room. And I started with the next surgery. And <clears throat> I received a call from the recovery room, very upset. The pain of the patient was unbelievable. He was shouting, he was crazy, he was mad, and he couldn't move the left leg. It was a total plagia. And um, <clears throat> I was asked what next. And so you have to imagine I was just with my next patient. I couldn't go away. Um, and I had to decide from telephone what to do. Um, going straight to the OR or going for imaging or anything else, um, Jonathan, may I ask you, what, what would you do in this situation? That patient is in the recovery unit. Yeah, like, and, like 30 minutes. Right, right. Uh, these, these situations are always the worst because, you know, you, your gut says, oh, just take them back and, um, and, uh, and, and uh, just bring them up, open them up. Um, he, you said that he had a pretty florid neuro deficit. He couldn't even move his left leg at all, right? Yes, after surgery. Before it was like M4, he was able, it was ambulatory, right. not a severe right. problem. But after surgery, um, immediately M0, right. total plagia and mm -hmm. severe, so, severe pain. Assuming that he, there is no issue with his pain control, meaning that they adequately, you know, they gave him some sort of adequate first line anti-pain medication, and he's still like that. I'd, I'd probably just take him back. I, I wouldn't, uh, I, would, I would just skip the imaging. Jonathan, we are like, like twins. Uh, so I said, make better pain control. Getting down from 10 of 10, give him opioids, give him uh, everything you have. And I uh, asked my resident to order an emergency MRI. So I, I have to say, this is, I, I uh, gained some time. And 45 minutes later, I could go to him and um, as expected, the MRI, uh, he was just on the way to the MRI. I did a 10-second uh, uh, examination, and um, he was able to uh, move a bit his leg like M3, and um, he was um, smiling at me under severe morphine, like meiosis, and he was feeling good, um, no pain. Uh, Lasik was negative, and so I was like, oof. Maybe it's only pain control. I was relaxed. I was doing some documentation when the radiologist called me and said, you, you don't believe it. Come to me, please. I have to show you something. And um, so I hurried to the um, uh, MRI, which is not direct to the OR. It's a university, big house, like 500 meters. And um, I was there, and he showed me these findings. And um, I just, uh, I, everybody knows this is blood, um, but, but Wendy, can you, can you tell me why is this signal in T1 not black? Um, so you're, is this a T1 or is this a T2? T, this um, is T2, sorry, this yeah, is T2. I was gonna say, I have it's everything. T1, this you're is really T1. In okay. It's not black in T1, it's not black in T2. Um, yeah, so it, in the cord itself, that's something that would be um, black. And so you have a collection that's outside. It's not, now we have nothing. Did we lose your picture? Okay, so it's Sorry. it's variable in the spine. It's not as well defined what the product, blood products are as in the brain. I just know when I see it in the cord parenchyma and it's black, it's blood. Here though, yes, you have a big mixed collection. Um, yeah. 
But it's can interesting me, because we see where is this hematoma, Wendy? Can you tell so me where is this hematoma? Is this you, you've got epidural? it in the dorsal, dorsal epidural space? It looks like you might have some into the fecal sac, but I don't, I don't know. It looks mostly um, epidural, though. Yeah. I would think. I don't know. Maybe you've got some in there too. I'm not sure. <laughs> It's and a mess. I'm sorry. <laughs> and, and the extent, the extent of the blood, where does it go? I yeah, um at least let's see, five, four, three, two, one. It goes up pretty high. Um, I mean it's the thickest down lower, but I would say a little bit at least going down one. So I, I caused it. I know it comes from 4.5 and then it went up uh, until T12 and it went down to S2, S3. And who, who thinks it's a venous and who thinks it's arterial bleeding? Has anybody um, suggested is this venous or arterial? Can I vote out loud? <laughs> Jonathan, I mean, would you say who's, it's who's a, watching the chat? Vote. It's you know it's probably uh, Venus just just if you're going to go with uh, with the odds but um, you're, you're probably going to tell me it's arterial. So. <laughs> yeah. if, he, if it was so, arterial, he'd be in trouble, right? I mean, I, he'd uh, be in trouble if it's arterial. So I I went to the MRI and the patient went back to the recovery room and so it was like uh, me 500 meters here, 500 meters back the patient, and um, I received the call from the anesthetist. We stopped the program for you. We were waiting for you to go, and then we put him back into the OR. <clears throat> so I didn't know how was the patient doing, so I went back to the recovery room. So it was a busy day for me. And in the recovery room, I um, found the patient doing fine. He asked me, oh, may I drink? I'm thirsty. He had no weakness at all, no leg pain, but won't pain. So a patient like usual. And all the staff from the OR, from the recovery room was looking at me. I'm, I felt like I'm, I'm naked there and they wanted a decision for me what to do. <clears throat> and I guess, um, Jonathan, you will say, uh, wait and see. And um, this is what, um, what I said um, with this neurology, with this recovery, I, I will not put him back into the OR. I have to wait and see um, how is he doing the next days. And um, wait and see meant I stayed in hospital that night. Yeah? So I, I went to him every hour. I checked him on my own. I didn't ask my residents. I, I did it on my own. And I, I slept in the hospital, just I, I didn't know. And always when he said, oh, there's a little bit tingling in the, in the leg, I, I thought, OK, now, now I have to go back. But, but he was really fine. So three days later, we made the next uh, MRI. And that finally, we see some black stuff here in the spinal canal. So everybody agrees this is blood, or? Wait, so you took him back? You, you took him back? No, I didn't took him back. Uh, I was just on the ward, and uh, we were uh, observing him. I was okay. just watching him recovering, and he was fine. He was walking. There was no leg pain. There was no weakness at all. And so this is just a control MRI. We did nothing, no revision surgery. Mm. You know, it's interesting, Alex, because I, we, where I came from before, we had, it was a big spine center, I saw so many of these, and we always commented how these epidural hematomas could look so bad, and yet patients had no symptoms, or sometimes they didn't look bad at all, and they were very symptomatic, so you really can't tell by the imaging often. But I want to say that I've never seen a picture of what, what you're showing here. <laughs> yeah, and this is... Um, Four months later, um, the patient was fine. I have to convince to go to the MRI again for academic reasons. He said, I don't want to pay for it. So we, we did it uh, on our own and he was really fine. Um, so what did I learn? As Wendy said, uh, MRI is not the truth. So how is the, people do, uh, the patient doing? Uh, you can't see on MRI. And surprisingly, um, epidural hematoma with this extension can be treated conservatively without surgery. And decision should be made on clinical findings, not on MRI in these emergency situations. Very important for me. And check your own pulse. I was running through the hospital quite, quite often and have to do some um, um, important decisions. Uh, you have to rest down, think twice, say I need some minutes for, for my decision um, and don't, don't rush into a, a bad decision. Alex, that's a great case. Uh, this is not again. Oh, uh, 
and uh, you know, I mean, another learning point, and I learned that too, usually like expanding hematomas really present with excruciating pain, pain that is disproportional to what you would expect post-op. Say this guy didn't have a deficit, just had pain. Usually it's also an expanding hematoma. Uh, I learned that too, you know, when you see someone post-op, uh, experiencing significant pain either right away or in a delayed fashion after a few days then then you should uh, be suspicious of an expanding hematoma yeah thank you Nader. Uh, i learned a lot from this case and i learned a lot uh, from uh, the radiology uh, blood uh, especially blood that is like 30 minutes old uh, can look any anyhow in the MRI, it must not be black. Black, it could be hypo, hyper, and um, really, it's not the truth. So uh, this is another herniated disc um, uh, at our university hospital. The helicopter landed, and the emergency um, doc called us. And there was a patient after micro discectomy uh, in a in a very very severe condition. And um, the patient had a recurrent uh, herniated disc um, seven days after the first surgery. And then a second surgery was performed. Um, and you know, uh, as always, uh, you want to be better in the uh, second uh, surgery. And uh, the patient was in the recovery room in the small hospital. And he had, she had um, severe abdominal pain, um, tachycardia, hypotension. She was in a shock and the um, patient was sent to emergency um, CAT scan. And uh, you all sit down, don't you? Nobody's standing. Yeah? So uh, this was the CAT scan uh, and you see uh, arterial bleeding Hi. from the aorta or the iliac um, artery and the amount of hematoma, uh, it pushes the liver up. Uh, it's a huge retroperitoneal hematoma um, and um, <clears throat> the patient was um, in a life-threatening condition. This is the actual um, <clears throat> view, and you see there's the belly is full of hematoma, the retroperitoneum, uh, the altar is, is there. Um, it's really scary. I have never seen this before. I've never seen a CAT scan like this after. It was a once-in-a-lifetime CAT scan, and um, you can see here on the actual view down there, this is the approach from the micro discectomy um, and the um, force of the kerosene ranger or whatever must have hit the iliac artery here and it was a, a massive bleeding life-threatening <clears throat> as you as you all know you need a friend um, and the, the friend was the vascular surgeon maybe it was just too aggressive discectomy because you wanted to take out every thing that not another recurrent uh, discectomy, uh, discectomy is necessary, another herniated disc. Um, but this nucleotomy is really, really uh, the reason why the patient almost died. Um, the hemoglobin went down to 40. Um, the vascular surgeon did an uh, awesome job. He saved the life um, and the ah. patient survived. She was not our patient. Um, we treated her just by consults um, for um, several days and weeks. She went to rehab and uh, she, she recovered. So this is the most um, <laughs> scary arterial bleeding I've ever seen in my life. And I um, uh, think um, it, uh, I always think of her when I do um, discectomy, when I go uh, with the rongeur into the disc space. And later, um, there was good publications, good RCTs that nucleotomy is not necessary, just taking out the sequester from the um, intraspinal um, side where the compression um, is um, ongoing, don't do severe nucleotomy. Does anybody of you um, do nucleotomy in every case or is just re sequestrectomy for you the plan? The primary plan. Nada, may I ask you, how many discectomies did you do in your career until now? Um, I can't count them. It's a pretty common operation. Uh, so I don't do like an aggressive discectomy. I just do uh, 
you know, I removed the herniated portion, either the disc bulge or the uh, subligamentous disc herniation. I don't really go after, I don't do an aggressive uh, nucleotomy. If that's the question, so. Do, do you mind if I ask, what do you mean by, what do you mean, what's your definition of an aggressive nucleotomy? So <clears throat> when you go into a high disc and you have a herniated disc and you take out like a, a big hernia, Mm -hmm. And you look into um, the hole um, with a with a microscope. You you see the perforation site and the um, annulus, and you see there are a fluffy material, uh, pulposes, nucleus pulposes. Do you take more out or just leave it there? I got you. Um, I, I I tend to go after that. Yeah, what I do is I I, I start using some combination of pituitary bonger, a down going curette. Um, I irrigate into this space a couple of times, just, just whatever comes out easy. I don't, I don't try to chase after anything. I, I don't, you know, um, whatever comes out just through those basic maneuvers I take out. Um, and then, and then I, then I'm, I'm finished. Once I irrigate, I don't feel anything with like a, a ball tip, uh, pro, um, one, you know, what you're, this, this case is literally always in the back of my head. Whenever I think about this, one of the things that I've done, and again, in my very short career as a spine surgeon. When I'm entering the disc space with the uh, pituitary laundry, I always keep it closed. I feel the where I feel it to be the ventral portion of that disc, and I always pull it back, and then I do it a little bit just so I make sure I'm not taking a bite too deep. I try not to bite when I'm uh, deep in there, and I can't feel what I'm doing. It's very it's it's very tricky. I mean, all all you're going with is is your haptic feedback. You have absolutely no visualization uh, once that uh, instrument goes uh, beyond the uh, confines of that posterior annulus. Yeah. It's like, I always try to say, this is not a tea leaf surgery. This is not a fusion surgery. Uh, yeah. It's taking out some fluffy material, <laughs> rinsing the disc space and, and um, being really gentle to the soft tissue um, because of complications like this. Um, if something does not want to come out, leave it there. It mm. should not come out there. So this yeah. is the, uh, the herniated disc <laughs> and um, in too aggressive telium discectomy, this is something different. Um, I go with completely different instruments into the disc space. I want to denude uh, the bone for, for grafting. And there was a case, uh, you can see it's uh, pretty um, a long time ago. It's more than 10 years ago. Uh, this DVX cage was my first cage. Nicolas Sampram from Spain just mentioned it um, several uh, weeks ago. And this was my first cage. Um, I learned with a DVX cage. And this was a 40 year old patient. Um, she um, received this T lift because of back pain and uh, a disc problem L5 as one. And then um, later on the ward, she dropped with a um, hemoglobin and uh, she needed transfusion. <clears throat> and um, from the clinical finding, um, we have seen she noticed the swelling of the left leg. And the color was different. Left color was um, more livid or more blue. And uh, we um, just found in the CAT scan that there was a, a retroperitoneal hematoma, but it was not an arterial bleeding. It was like a venous bleeding. Um, and uh, she didn't require any surgery. Um, she recovered really good. The um, swelling um, went back and in postoperative control, she was fine. So these are the two um, cases of venous bleeding and arterial bleeding. Uh, they are completely different for the patient, um, but always remind me not to be too aggressive uh, in T-lift surgery. Um, if you wanna do a good inter um, body fusion, um, don't be too aggressive. You could hurt some uh, pre uh venous complex. You can cause a lot of more problems. So she was doing well. Did anybody of, from you have had any injury of the pre uh, structures in t lip in antibody surgery from the back? I, well, I'm gonna step in here. I actually, I have new appreciation for all of you now because um, this, it wasn't my case, but I was there. We had a case, you know, we do biopsies kind of mm. next to the vertebral bodies or maybe even in front. And I've seen a, a venous bleed like this before. The difference though is we're doing it under CT so we can watch and we know where our needle is, which I guess is a little bit different for you than, you know, it just kind of happens and you're not seeing it happen. Um, so it would be a lot scarier. These, like you said, they kind of resolve on their own, but they're not, 
it's still a little bit scary, even if it's Venus like this, because they can expand quite a bit. Um, yeah. I, and one other thing, you, lucky, you have some CTAs here. I think John Shin, who is here, we, John Shin and Mike Selby are here too. I don't know if you saw them, so we need them to be speaking up too. John Shin, didn't you have a case maybe six months ago? It was one of your great tumor cases, and there was it was non-contrast, but there was a bleed, and it was kind of hard to see on the non-contrast CT. Was that, am I remembering correctly? Maybe I'm not. It was one of your great thoracic, like maybe a chordoma case or something. Yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah, I'm so, yeah. Um, yeah, definitely. Those are tough cases. Uh, I'm sorry, my, my connection is a little unstable, so I'm sorry. Ah, we lost him. I will. I will ask um, John for another case later. Yeah. I need. I need. I need his advice for this. So <laughs> this was a tibia really. bleeding, and um, the funny thing is, I've never had a hematoma, a vascular injury in a lift surgery. When I go from interior, the vessels are there. I see them. I can treat them gently. I have a, a, a big awareness of them. The most severe complication in vascular injuries I've seen in surgeries from the back. So please don't say that going from interior is too dangerous because of the vessels. Uh, it's a pretty safe surgery, uh, especially L5-1 when you're going uh, between the people patient. So hey, uh, this was the t lift case. This is one for John. <laughs> please don't stone me for this. Um, this was a 19-year-old female um, patient. Uh, she fell from her house, and um, there was this um, burst fracture, L2 burst fracture. It was really more than a decade ago, 13 years ago, and uh, she had this A3 uh, burst fracture, um, but you see there's something going on in this vertebral body. It was a hemangioma, uh, a vertebra with hemangioma. I don't show you because I'm running out of time. The MRIs um, but um, our um, thoughts were, and it's like 30 years ago, going only from posterior or going from interior as well. Uh, this is the actual view. You see the hemangioma was in the vertebral body. The pedicles are not involved and the posterior um, uh, complex um, as well. And so if she didn't have this accident, she wouldn't have no problem, uh, we guess. So we did a posterior um, fusion first. This is our uh, USS fracture system. Uh, we always use this for uh, bisegmental posterior. And then uh, we uh, put her to, to the angio and we were looking what is going on there, but there was nothing severe to see. Um, uh, we did some embolization <laughs> and then we went for anterior surgery and we put in this, um, this expandable uh, cage. This was uh, 13 years ago. Do you know this implant? Does anybody recognize this? So what, um, what the cause, it was really nicely implanted. The patient was fine. Um, these were the three follow-ups always six months later. And finally, we did um, routine implant removal that time from posterior. We were taking out, and you, I think you can see what happened, don't you? There was pseudatrosis, um, not from the upper segment, but from the lower segment, and the cage uh, failed. There was a failure of the cage, and um, uh, <clears throat> it went down and down. And this is a complication from an implant. So, of course, it's a surgeon failure because it's pseudotrosis and we did implant removal um, and um, this happens, but the patient was really doing well. She was not in severe pain and she was doing great until two years later, she came with leg pain. And then we did an MRI. <laughs> Meanwhile, the implant was recalled. It was class one recalled. It's not uh, more longer available. We were not the only ones with this complication. <laughs> you don't find this cage any longer on the market. And uh, the patient came back later uh, with these findings. You see, um, there's some tumor coming out of L2, coming out of the burst L2 body. And um, <clears throat> we found a huge epidural mass. 
Uh, we did biopsy first. It was hemangioma. There was no uh, malignancy. It was not a malignant tumor. It was benign. It was still this hematoma. We did angio. We did everything. Um, and then uh, we decided to make um, the marginal tumor resection. We didn't take out the whole um, um, uh, fracture. Maybe John, you would you would do so. Or is, is John still there? Would John go for uh, on block resection in this case? I think he's the one with the biggest experience. Or Mike would Mike Salvi from Australia would would you go for on block resection or would you do just damage control and make a an marginal tumor resection in this benignant tumor? Um, I think uh, with an atypical hemangioma, I'd usually do what you did. Um, I think this is just terrible bad luck. I don't think there's anything wrong with uh, with doing a uh, a marginal resection or intralesional treatment here. Um, the only other thing is whether you consider any adjuncts, but yeah, this, this was treated over 10 years ago. I think it was uh, far, uh, far less knowledge in that area. Yeah. So we put her into the OR. It was the third surgery from the back. We put in new screws. Um, this is an old system. We, I don't use it anymore. It's USS2. And we did this tumor resection on block. We um, <clears throat> did a wide resection, but not on block resection. And, and that was it. She was doing fine. She was very young. The bone quality was excellent. And now she's under control and there was no recurrence um, again. So what did I learn from this complication? <laughs> Don't leave your good implants um, just because somebody says they made it better. Uh, this was really a disaster. <coughs> this complication due to a bad implant. <coughs> Excuse me. And you're helpless as a surgeon. So you think you're doing something good, <coughs> something new, and then it's worse than if you had used the older implant. And still, until today, I used the older implant, which is now <coughs> almost 20 years old. And don't underestimate the presence of hemangioma in the area of your interest. When you're doing surgery on a virtual body and there's a hemangioma inside it, you leave a biologic reaction. Maybe um, <clears throat> a hemangioma gets invasive. Um, you, you open something, just think of it, <laughs> make controls, and um, maybe uh, earlier surgery would have uh, been a smaller surgery. And we stop with implant removal as a routine surgery <clears throat> when the patient is too good. Do you do do you use um, or do you perform implant removal in, in any case, in every case? In trauma case, when the fusion is there, is present, the patient is fine, do you take out the implants? Hey, T, Mike, we've uh, asked you. Yeah, of course. We've been doing um, uh, implant removal uh, routinely for non-fusion cases for burst fracture and uh, we were doing that with the open chance pins 25 years ago my mentors were when I started doing MIS we'd aim for fracture healing and then try to take out implants in relatively stable fracture patterns but with collapse um, if I fuse someone formally like you did uh, I wouldn't aim for implant removal unless I was concerned about uh, particularly cranial facet violation um, and, you know, the problem with the Shans pins, as you know, those fixed angle devices is that it can be very difficult to completely spare the facets at the cranial level. Uh, one of the reasons why I've gone away. Yeah, this is a good point. This is a good point. I don't miss the monoaxial screws in my daily routine, but in the trauma cases, I, I like them uh, still. I, I can't hear everything from you due to the connection. So um, I, uh, I go on. <clears throat> so this is the worst case um, of mine, maybe the most complex. And um, this is a patient who was first seen by us in the outpatient clinic with a lumbar problem, spinal stenosis, a pain. He was 80 years old, a severe smoker. And then uh, we were informed by the colleagues from internal medicine neurology that the patient was hospitalized because of a gait disorder. He had a cervical problem, a radicular pain in the right arm, weakness. He was not able to walk free any longer. He needed help. And he, it was a classic constellation from uh, radicular myelopathy. Uh, but uh, very special, he was a rapid um, worsening of the symptoms within uh, several days and weeks. 
So this is his uh, cervical spine. As you can see, um, it's pretty straight. You see all the degenerative um, <clears throat> changes um, we expect in an 80 years old smoker. And this is the MRI. Um, Wendy, may I again ask you to, to tell us uh, what you can see uh, from your neuro red point? Well, I, I, so um, you have multiple levels of stenosis in the cervical spine too, maybe a little bit of core signal at two, three, but so did you say these symptoms happened after your lumbar surgery? Is that right? No, he was never operated. He was oh, always seen. Okay. I thought he you were going somewhere seen. else with that. Yeah. And okay. we know from the first um, consultation, he had no cervical problems, no neck pain, no neck gait disorder. And this was a um, special consultation because we knew him. And then something new happened within some weeks and worsening over some days. And this was the cervical spine, and um, this is the X-ray. But you're so you're saying it's in his spine, and you're not looking at his brain for sure. Yeah. Is that what you're telling me? Yeah. Okay. Well, then you've got a lot of stenosis, and maybe you've got some edema at two three. Maybe. Yeah. This was our uh, thought that two three um, was uh, the biggest um, <clears throat> narrowing, and I expected then that one level should be the reason why the patient deteriorated so quickly because that he gets worse due to four segments um, simultaneously, it was not very um, obvious for me. So I thought when I just make a laminectomy from C3, I can decompress two, three by flavectomy. I can uh, resect um, um, flavum three, four as well. And because of his C6 uh, radiculopathy, I would do a foramen of facetotomy only on the right side. Um, I was not planning to do any fusion surgery because he had no severe neck pain. I knew him several weeks before. He was fine in my out clinical um, um, uh, practice. So again, this was the sagittal um, um, X-ray. <laughs> the axial view narrowed to three. This is the 5.6 on the right side. There was a narrowed uh, foramen, and this is the X-ray. Does anybody want to see something else? Is, is this enough for you to go into surgery, or do you need more information? Does anybody, anybody want to take over and ask me, is there something missing? We did everything. We did CAT scan, we did everything. And it was just this um, hypertrophy flavum. It was the myelin compression to three, three, four. But you didn't do flex X. Pardon? You didn't do flexion extension. Do you need that? Mm, no, it, funny, I will, I will show you some uh, uh, post-op. <laughs> uh, no, I didn't do um, extension flexion. Um, maybe uh, I should have. So this was um, the post-op imaging. I always do um, MRI post-op because um, I want to know whether I did an um, adequate job. And intraoperative, I found it very um, lax. It was very flexible, uh, especially two, three was uh, really not rigid, it, not rigid at all. Um, and um, due to this, I took off the flavum four, five, and five, six, six, seven again, uh, two, um, but not laminectomy. So you see all the lamina are still there. You can see it on the x ray uh, post op as well. And the patient was really doing good. So the uh, the weakness um, went back. He was able to walk. He had pain in the arm. He had pain in the neck uh, where the wound was, um, but he was uh, quite happy um, with, uh, with his um, uh, autonomy. He, he gained a lot back. So this is the X-ray uh, post-op, and you can see it was just missing C3. And four, five, six are there. Seven is here, um, two here. I did not do multi-level laminectomy, just decompression, flavectomy. And the patient was really fine. And um, you know, he was fine until one day, uh, four weeks later, I was not thinking of this patient. At that time, my colleague from the emergency room sent me, showed me this one photo. And I think, oh yes, no, please not. And this was the photo. And you can see this was a um, wound infection. Um, 
And I would love to hear uh, at this point uh, from my presentation, anybody from you, um, my questions, uh, please uh, use the chat box. Uh, what are your thoughts? Because uh, thoughts are very important. We had a fantastic talk from Kara Setney several months ago about what you feel when you see something. Um, do you think, oh gosh, I'm so glad I didn't put in some implants, now it's easier to treat? Or do you think now it's time to put in some implants? Or do you think, see, mm, I should have fused this patient now I can't and I'm in big trouble. Again, may I ask some of you doing a lot of posterior cervical, uh, maybe you have seen a complication like this um, too. What are your thoughts in this situation? Alexander, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can hear you. you got me now. Hey, um, look, I think posterior cervical surgery has a really high wound complication rate. Uh, and, you know, I, I'm sort of leaning towards A here. I think no implants makes this a lot easier because if you've got to do extensive work to clean out implants and, and suppress when they're already in there, I think that, that makes it hard. You've got an opportunity now to get this right um, and healed and then come back later if you had to deal with any potential instability in the future. Um, but, you know, for posterior necks, I'm, I'm so rigorous now after surgery. Uh, I use an absorbable stitch and staples to try to keep them closed. I drain them for 48 hours just to make sure they're dry. I use vancomycin powder. Uh, and for their own protection, I put all these patients in a collar because I think the collar actually stops them moving their neck too much. And most of the time, it, um, it, it allows them to heal up that little bit better. But this is a tough area. And I think this is why most of us, the simple case, is favor anterior surgery. Yeah. Thank you, Ed. I think one of the biggest problems was he, his smoker's stages. He was smoking so much and when he was in the emergency room, <clears throat> he went out to smoke. <clears throat> and it's uh, really, um, I underestimated this. A collar is a good option. Sometimes I see too much pressure on the spinous process, and then you, the collar is causing a decubitus uh, um, um, a pressure also like this. It's really hard, but a soft collar is always a good option for these. So what did I do? I did a wound debridement biopsy. I found out what bugs are there, uh, lavage and closure with drainages. Um, that it was four weeks after the primary um, surgery. And then <clears throat> it uh, was that the wound looked like this, and there was a lot of secretion coming out of this point. You see, this is um, necrosis of the skin here, and this was like 10 days later. And um, <clears throat> it was um, obvious that uh, this uh, wound needs another surgery for my colleagues. I wasn't there at that time in the hospital, um, and um, my colleagues called the plastic surgeons and the plastic surgeons uh, wanted to help. And they said, okay, we put in some rotator flap. Uh, and they take it out from here. And um, you, you see this, um, uh, this muscle skin uh, flap is placed into the uh, cervical wound um, to improve the healing. And this is the final um, <clears throat> look um, from the revision surgery, the second one, uh, you see the drainages, and this is a vital flap um, doing uh, his work in the um, wound. Have you ever seen um, cervical um, uh, surgery needing um, plastic surgery in your career? Has anybody experienced with these rotator flaps? Day one post-op, there was a diffuse bleeding. The patient was going into a hemorrhagic shock. Everything was full of blood. My resident, I don't know whether Lucas is listening tonight. Uh, Lucas, he, he really saved uh, his life. He organized everything that he went straight into the um, OR back for control of the bleeding, um, followed by a four weeks stay in the intensive care unit. And the patient went to severe valleys. He was really in a bad condition. And after these four weeks, he went into a rehab and uh, he was doing fine. So there was no myelopathy. The skin, the wound healed. 
And he was under antibiotics for like six weeks and then off. And then um, he, I, I saw him in the outpatient uh, clinics as well. So again, my question, has anybody from you experience with plastic surgery flaps helping you for wound infections in the cervical spine? Alex, um, question for you. What was the reasoning that they wanted to jump to a trapezius flap on that patient? It, it just seems super aggressive. I would have thought to do like a wound back or, or you know, um, maybe even another washout before, um, before jumping back. That's very, very aggressive. Was there a particular reason for that or? I can't answer this question uh, very well, uh, Jonathan, but yes, you're absolutely right. And this is the best question. Um, the need for this um, flap can be discussed um, for hours, but I was not there. I was not there in decision making um, and the wound healing problem was obvious and uh, they wanted to help the patient with the final solution. They didn't want it to go for surgery and surgery. And so there was this decision to go big. Um, but um, I was not um, convinced that this was really the best uh, approach, small approach, um, step by step, perhaps a vacuum therapy for uh, several times can help uh, for conditioning um, the soft tissue. And um, finally, <clears throat> you're again my twin brother, Jonathan, um, because um, <clears throat> This is uh, the first pre-op uh, cervical spine. This is the second one. And Wendy, this is an extension X-ray. Um, this is German word reclination. Um, and the patient was fine post-op, but then uh, I've seen him in my outpatient clinic like six months later. And uh, so he was unlucky, but not in pain. He had no uh, myelopathy. Um, but he couldn't um, look up. He was always like a cock robin uh, situation uh, like this. And he is uh, unlucky until today. So this is my, we did all this stuff, a CT, MRI. Um, I want you just to have a look to the soft tissue in the back, um, what happened um, with the flap, big atrophy. So the flap was a, a huge maximal approach but by time, this muscle goes down because it has no function. Um, it's just filling the hole um, in the neck, but it's not helping um, in extension. So there was a really a severe damage of the posterior band, um, the posterior complex, the infection, um, and the whole history made it really to this situation. And I'm very unlucky <laughs> with this, um, but the patient um, refused to go in any surgery. And I understand him. Um, he had a bad time with this shock, with this ICU stay. Um, <clears throat> and um, what I think, what I missed mostly was the coronal ambulance. I should have um, paid more attention to the AP view of the uh, cervical spine, because this is pre-op. This is post-op, and this is now. And you see, it's not only the kyphosis, it's also the coronal um, uh, disbalance. Uh, C23, the joint on the right side is completely gone. And um, this, this patient is not able uh, to uh, lift the, um, um, to correct the head in the coronal um, <clears throat> uh, plane. Uh, he can correct with reclination uh, his kyphosis but this um, coronal disbalance is the main problem for him. You know, so when Alex, he rotates, oh, I'm sorry, I'm yeah, sorry. Jonathan. I was going to say, I, I don't think your decision was wrong at all. The, the I don't, I don't. I think this is all related to the flap. I don't think it has anything to do with uh, um, the. You essentially did like a skip laminectomy on him. Um, yeah, but, uh, not 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 even laminectomy skip. It was right, a flavectomy, right. but Flab -flab otherwise, I, right. I I did weaken. I did weaken yeah, from I the back. Yes, I did weaken from the back and I was thinking about fusion intraoperatively. Um, because when you are, we have got the situs open and you check your um, stability and you have your own experience. Uh, the first time uh, when the new residents come into the cervical spine, they always think, oh, this is unstable. This rotates so much. 
this has to be fixed, it's unstable, but this is the physiological um, uh, movement of the cervical spine. We don't fuse it, but in this situation, uh, from my experience, it was luck. It was too unstable, and I mm. did not fuse it. And I sh think I um, I should have examined better. Um, like Wendy said, a flexion extension um, X-rays are not too bad. Uh, they give you more information pre-op. And um, when I would do it again, I would go for a longer segment fusion from the back. So do you think that infection was caused by lack of fusion? I, I don't think so. No, I, no, I think... not by lack of fusion. Yeah. But if you fuse, um, if you fuse today, you have got good antibiotic regimes. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it comes up that you have um, an infection and we can treat these without implant removal. We can do an implant associated um, infection with antibiotics with creative um, approach. And so I'm not so in uh, fear if I have implants in my vote infection as I've been 13 years or 15 years ago. So 15 years ago, especially when I was in, a, in an area where um, um, the resistant staph aureus was very, very present, uh, we all have had a lot of fear. But today, there's a good regime to um, maintain the implants in situ. And so I think um, I would choose fusion in this uh, situation because of the instability. I don't want to go back to this situs post-op in an infectious situs again. And if I fuse it um, in the first situation, it's better. But this is just a lesson learned from this case. So. <clears throat> this was um, my my last um, my last case. Um, I just wanted to point out that I regret non-fusion situs much more often than a fused one when it comes to complications. Um, this sounds like uh, we all know this, um, but this is for the elderly patients with a high cervical instability. Um, I I vote for a fusion um, better longer than short. And in general, like Jonathan said, I don't need plastic surgeons in my daily practice. I don't need them in uh, wound infections. Even the very um, severe infections I can manage on my own. The plastic surgeons are for the orthopedics, for legs and arms, maybe for breasts and for, for, for many reasons. They are nice guys, but they have a uh, no biomechanics, they, they, they don't help you um, preventing these complications and filling a hole. This is not a strategy. I like to have a hole, but a straight spine and I don't need a um, muscle flap going into atrophy post-op. And I just want to mention, you have to thank your residents more often because uh, Lukas Ubanch has really saved his life. And uh, thank you again. For that was fantastic and perfect timing, Alex, too. But before we go, I just because we have Mike Selby and Nodder just disappeared there. Did, did you have any last comments, Mike? Uh, no, I think uh, Alex's talk was fantastic. And uh, yeah, as, uh, as was uh, just discussed on the chat box, I think all of us have seen uh, these things or variations of these things. And, um, you yeah, know, it's always reassuring to know that other people have these complications. <laughs> I think that's a, that's yeah. a big thing. That was, yeah. man, that was fantastic. Those were great cases. Yeah. Can't wait to see more of those. That was in great teaching points. So thanks so much, Alex, and for everybody joining us. Um, but we're, we're at the end of the hour. So we'll see everyone next week. I am afraid I do not know who next week's guest is. It's a guest of Dr. Koi Tan, but um, join us anyway. And thanks again to Alex and everybody who joined us today. Uh, goodbye. Thank you, Alex. Appreciate it.